Hello there, AP Environmental Science class. Welcome back to part two of my lecture on chapter 12, food production and the environment. All right, we left off talking about uh, food production. In part one, we spoke about how um, we produce food and not only uh, crops, but also meat and fish on mass scales. And then we began talking about how this mass meat production, mass agriculture, mass uh, fish production um, is not great for the environment. And that's where we're going to kind of pick up now here uh, with part two of this lecture. So uh, we also spoke a little bit about uh, genetically engineered foods in part one uh, of this lecture. We'll talk a little bit about it more now. So there is a controversy over uh, genetically engineered food. Genetically engineering could help improve food security around the world. However, little is known about the long-term health effects of these genetically engineered food. Again, could have some toxins in there uh, that could trigger inflammatory responses in the body, et cetera, et cetera. Potential environmental effects of genetically modified populations in the wild as well. So basically what uh, you do with the genetically engineered food is you're, uh, you know, splicing DNA and putting it in uh, another organism. Well, that could then create an organism that is a hybrid uh, to natural organisms. So then uh, when you release these organisms, potentially back into the environment, uh, what kind of issues are, are they going to uh, cause? So again, um, we don't know yet, but there could be a potential uh, effects of this. So uh, once again, uh, here's a great chart for us here, trade-offs. Again, genetically engineered or genetically modified uh, crops and food, potential benefits on the left, but possible drawbacks on the right. So as always, understand a few of these at least so you can use them on any potential FRQs. So what are potential benefits of these genetically modified foods? May need less fertilizer, pesticides, and water to grow. Can be resistant to insects, disease, frost, and drought if that's what you're engineering uh, your organism for. Could grow faster and could raise those crop yields. May tolerate higher levels of herbicides and could have a longer shelf life on the supermarket store. What are possible drawbacks? Again, unpredictable genetic and ecological effects. Could put toxins in foods. Could repel or harm pollinators that usually go in, right? These would be bees. These would be other types of insects. Um, can promote pesticide-resistant insects, uh, insects, herbicide-resistant weeds, and plant diseases. So that could actually... Uh, harm right plants and could disrupt the seed market and end up reducing biodiversity uh, in the end. So again, pros, cons of these genetically engineered foods, obviously know a little bit of each. All right. There are limits to the expanding green revolution. So we spoke about in part one that we had two uh, green revolutions over the last 100, 150 years. The first one involved the uh, you know, mass irrigation, uh, pesticides, uh, synthetic pesticides, uh, you know, uh, uh, fertilizer, synthetic fertilizer to help increase crop yields. And then the second one was these genetically modified foods and organisms uh, that, again, that's kind of the second green revolution uh, that we've been in for the past uh, 20 to, 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 to 30 years. Well, most green revolution and generally engineered crop varieties require large inputs of fertilizer, pesticides, and water. They're often too expensive for many farmers. So what we're learning is that these uh, genetically engineered crop varieties pr are producing yields that are no higher than those of the traditional strains. Again, the whole idea of gen genetically uh, modified crops is to really produce more. The more food we have, the more uh, or the less food insecurity there will be on the planet. What we're finding out, though, is that this second green revolution, these genetically crop varieties, and even the first green revolution that involved the fertilizers and the pesticides and the water, we're finding out now down the road here, you know, decades later, uh, that it's not good for the environment. Because again, not only do you need these large inputs of fertilizer, pesticides, and water, but again, often too expensive for many farmers. Uh, and again, the yields are not being, uh, are not greater. So obviously, are there some benefits uh, from organic farming? Again, organic is more like tr tr the uh, traditional farming. Uh, it builds soil organic matter. So that's a good thing. Reduces erosion and water pollution. That's a good thing, right? Uses less fossil fuel energy, cuts greenhouse gas emissions. You can match conventional yields, believe it or not. Uh, you can actually do that. Uh, they're more weed tolerant. 
Crops compare favorably in years of drought, and they're actually more profitable. So in a way, these are the benefits of that organic agriculture, not the mass production that we're seeing on most of our farms uh, around the world. This is more of your traditional mom and pop type operations. Now, obviously, with all the good, there's always some bad. Uh, there are some problems or some drawbacks with organic farming. Uh, one of those problems is that you're going to leach or you're going to uh, seep nitrates into groundwater from composted manure that is used as fertilizer. But again, I would argue that may be, a, that's an issue, but it may be a little less of an issue than having synthetic uh, fertilizers, those toxins leaching down in, in, into, in, into the groundwater, right? A large scale composting, a composting does generate some greenhouse gases, but not as much as running huge agricultural equipment, right? Some organic farmers resort to plowing to control weeds. This can actually lead to soil erosion and loss of soil nutrients. Um, because of that, an organic no-till system has been developed uh, to try to help those farmers not resort to plowing. So obviously some drawbacks from organic farming, but I would argue on the flip side, uh, those potential uh, positives uh, outweigh uh, the potential negatives here. So Moving on, talking now about industrialized meat production. So we talked about crops, right? Now we're talking a little bit about that meat production. Um, and again, harms the environment. Some of the pros, though, of the industrialized meat production. Again, this is when you have rows and rows of just cattle, right, living in an area, uh, just eating and then uh, being prepared to go to the slaughterhouse. It does increase meat supply. It does reduce overgrazing because again, these animals are not out in rangelands grazing around. They're in these pens, right? Or in these farms. And it actually can help keep food prices down. What are the cons? Uses large amounts of water to irrigate the grain crops that you have to feed to the animals. In addition, you're taking those grain crops away from human beings. They could be feeding humans and instead we're feeding them to animals. Okay, livestock waste, pollute waterways, makes sense. And again, uses large amounts of those of that energy, usually a greenhouse gas, or usually a fossil fuels, which again, admit the greenhouse gases. Um, so once again, here you go, trade-offs, pros and cons of these feedlots, or, or these again, these industrialized meat uh, plants. Advantages, increased meat production, higher profits, less land use, reduce overgraving, reduces soil erosion. It actually does protect biodiversity. But on the flip side, disadvantages. Animals are unnaturally confined and crowded. There's your ethical issue. Uh, again, large inputs of grain, fish meal, water, and fossil fuels, large greenhouse gas emissions, large concentration of animal waste that can pollute the water, and use of antibiotics within those feedlots can increase genetic resistance to microbes in humans. Basically, what that means is when you eat meat that has antibiotics in it, uh, your body, uh, out of mutations, you basically can get microbes that are resistant to those antibiotics, and that could obviously lead to more sickness uh, among human beings. So again, positives, negatives. Once again, understand them all, at least a few on each side to be able to uh, talk about that, that in an FRQ. All right, moving along, talking about aquaculture. Again, what was aquaculture? Remembering back from part one, these are fish farms. All right, this is where we're not just catching fish randomly out in the ocean, but actually farming fish in pens. So several environmental uh, problems. Fish are caught to use as feed on fish farms. So it actually contributes to the depletion of wild fish. And you can have environmental toxins. What this is saying is that many fish farms are actually used, fish in these aquacultures are actually used to then feed the fish to other fish, right? So now we're depleting the wild fish to feed to other fish and any toxins in the fish farm fish, you're now feeding to other fish that then humans are going to in ingest. So obviously an issue there. Pesticides and antibiotics on fish farms are a source of pollution. And these fish farms are usually in shallow areas near the coast. And as a result, we're seeing the destruction and degradation of mangrove forests to put your fish farms in, right? You cut your mangrove forests down right along the shore. That's where you put in these fish farms, this aquaculture. But what did we say? Mangrove forests were important for storm protection, for um, um, uh, 
taking out the pollution from water, right, coming in from the estuaries. So now you're degrading or destroying these mangrove forests, and obviously that is degrading the environment. So once again, our favorite charts, advantages of aquaculture on the left, disadvantages on the right, advantages, high efficiency, high yield, reduces the overharvesting of fisheries, because again, the fish are in these pens, they're not out in the wild, and there's jobs and profits. Disadvantage, large inputs of land, grain, and fish meal are needed. You have large waste output that could pollute uh, the aquatic systems, lots of loss of the mangrove forest and the estuaries like I just spoke about, and dense populations of these fish mean they are vulnerable to diseases, uh, which then can either kill all the fish in the aquaculture or maybe uh, those fish get out and then we ingest them, uh, obviously could lead to problems. So there you go, your pros and your cons. So going back to crops now, how can we protect crops from pests more sustainably? So what we're going to talk about here is how natural predators we're finding out are actually better than the synthetic pesticides that we've been using in these green revolutions, right? The whole idea of this green revolution, we came up with these pesticides, these chemical pesticides that we spray on our plants takes the pets, uh, pests away and the plants are able to grow and able to produce a greater yield. But what we're finding is it's not working as well as we thought. Okay, so we can sharply cut pesticides use without decreasing crop yields by using a mix of cultivation techniques, biological pest controls, those are natural predators, and then small amounts of selected chemical pesticides as a last resort. This is known as IPM or integrated pest management. So let's talk about this in more detail. Nature controls the population of most pests. What are pests? Well, pests are any type of organism, usually insects in this case, that interfere with human welfare. Natural enemies control pest populations. These are predators, parasites, diseases, disease organisms. They're in natural ecosystems and they're free ecosystem services, right? So when a predator eats a pest, that's actually an ecosystem service that the earth is providing to human beings. We have this pest, we don't like it, predator comes and eats it, thank you predator, there's an ecosystem service for us, right? Synthetic pesticides are chemicals that are used to kill or control pets. They are pests. They include insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, and rodenticides. Biopesticides are produced by plants uh, to ward off insects and herbivores. Again, these would be uh, pesticides produced by the plant itself. Okay, so the synthetic pesticides can help control pest populations. They do, right? First generation of pesticides were basically borrowed from plants. The second generation of pesticides, however, which includes DDT, it was lab produced. There's also broad spectrum agents or pesticides, which may mean they can be toxic to beneficial species. Broad spectrum means they kill everything, right? So you're spraying this pesticide on these plants that try to maybe kill a, a, a specific type of fly, but you're killing all these bees too because they're broad spectrum agents. They kill everything, right? You could have some narrow spec, uh, spectrum agents. That would be better, synthetic pesticides that just target one type of, of organism. And then you have uh, persistence varies, right? Um, so these are some issues that you may have. So what are some benefits of synthetic pesticides? Well, it actually helps save human lives from um, um, malaria uh, back in the day because the pesticides killed the mosquitoes that produced malaria, or at least would bite you and then uh, uh, transfer that malaria um, disease into your body. We have seen increased food supply and reduction in food losses because the pests aren't uh, eating our food on the vine before we pick it, right? Uh, it can help control erosion and build soil fertility by avoiding plowing. We don't have to plow with synthetic pesticides. It has helped farmers reduce costs and newer pest control methods in the last 10 to 15 years are a little more safer and a little more effective than they were in the past. But obviously, just going back here, there's one slide here of the benefits of synthetic pesticides. And now we're going to have four slides with the problems with synthetic pesticides. So obviously, these synthetic pesticides are not that great. They accelerate the development of genetic resistant in resistance in pests. We'll talk about that more in just a second. They are expensive for farmers. So while they save farmers money in one area, unfortunately, you have to buy these pesticides, and that is expensive in another area. 
Some insecticides kill natural predators or parasites that help control pests. Again, that's your broad spectrum type of insecticide that just kills everything. They cause environmental pollution, obviously, when they run off into our rivers and streams. They can harm other type of wildlife, and they can have health hazards to human beings as well. So synthetic pesticides, advantages. They have expanded food supply. They have raised profits. They work really quickly, and they're safe if they're used properly. Disadvantages, promoting that genetic resistance in our pests can kill pest natural en enemies and harm wildlife and people. The pesticides can pollute air, water, and land. And again, they are expensive for farmers to buy initially. This is what we're talking about with genetic resistance. So remember, most of our insects are going to be our selected species, right? What does that mean? That means they produce lots of offspring and produce many generations very quickly, right? So take a look at these insects, these beetles on this corn, right? In, in A, we're spraying the corn with a synthetic pesticide. And you'll notice that most of the beetles have died because of that synthetic pesticide. However, there's always one that has a mutation that allows it to survive that synthetic uh, pesticide. So we have one beetle that has survived. Well, obviously now, we learned in a previous chapter about natural selection and evolution. This one beetle now that is resistant to the synthetic pesticide is now the beetle that reproduces, right? So we reproduce all these beetles, which now have more beetles that are resistant to the pesticide because that's just how genetics works. So now we spray pesticides on them again. Well, some still die, but you'll notice many more are resistant now to the pesticide and that continues over generation and generation. This wouldn't be a problem if insects reproduced once a year, or once every five years, you know, like case selected species, but because they're reproducing all the time, it doesn't really take that long to get into a situation where now all of the beetles or most of the beetles are resistant to this chemical pesticide. So what does that mean? That means we now have to come up with another chemical pesticide to kill these pests. If you remember back from a previous chapter, the predator-prey relationship, right? As the prey evolves, the predator evolves with it because it's like an arm race. The predator has to kill the prey. The prey needs to hide from the predator. So as the prey is evolving to hide from the predator, the predator is evolving to always see that prey, right? And so if you use the natural predator instead of the synthetic pesticide, the natural predator, as the beetles mutate, will mutate with the beetles, and then you'll always have a predator to get rid of your pests. Unlike the synthetic pesticide, where every couple of years you got to come up with another type of pesticide to kill the beetles or the pests because the pests have become genetically resistant to the current pesticide. So again, big issue when it comes to these synthetic pesticides, and that's what we found out over decades, that it's really not working as well, and crop yields are either staying uh, similar to if you just use the natural predator as a as a pesticide, right? Not a synthetic pesticide. Uh, yields are equal or even less than using natural predators when you use synthetic pesticides. Because again, we're finding out that after a couple of generations, uh, the pests become resistant to the pesticide. So what can you do uh, to reduce exposure to pesticides? Well, grow some of your own food using the organic methods we spoke about. Only buy certified organic food at the food store. Wash and scrub all fruits and vegetables to get those pesticides off them. Eat less meat, no meat, or certified organically produced meat and before cooking trim the fat off the meat as well this could help you uh, again um, avoid some of the toxins um, that could be in there uh, because of the pesticides pesticide use has not consistently reduced u.s crop losses again what i just said now i'm putting it in words for you from 1942 to 1997 crop losses from insects increased from 7% to 13%, even with a 10-time increase in pesticide use. To me, that's the smoking gun, guys. It doesn't work, right? We increase pesticide use 10 times, right? The synthetic pesticides between 1942 and 1997, and we saw crop losses uh, actually increase by 6%. Again, shows you it doesn't work as well as we thought.
There was actually a 2014 study that showed no increase in soybean crop yields for crops treated with the three controversial neo uh, Neonicotinoids, which are basically just a type of synthetic pesticide. Uh, the pesticide industry, of course, disputes the findings. There's always a way to spin them. But honestly, at the end of the day, we're finding out that, again, the yields aren't much better uh, if there are any better yields with synthetic pesticides as uh, compared to using the traditional natural predators as your pesticide. So laws and treaties can help us to protect us from these harmful effects of pesticides. So obviously, federal agencies and y'all are laws, the EPA, USDA, FDA, right, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, U.S. Uh, Dairy and Agriculture Industry, the uh, Federal Drug uh, Administration, um, okay? Um, there was the Fungicide and Rodicide Act of 1947. There was the Co Food Quality Protection Act of 1996. Please understand what these acts did for us, all right? Go back uh, into the book and read into them a little bit more. More. Federal laws regulating pesticide use, however, is inadequate and, as always, poorly enforced because you need money to enforce the laws. And obviously, uh, money isn't funneled into these areas as much as they are funneled into other areas. Uh, you, in the U.S., exports, uh, we have exports many banned pesticides. Um, so actually, these poisons can be transmitted in the atmosphere, and we actually export a lot of banned uh, pesticides uh, as it is. So we're definitely at this point not helping our, our, our own cause here. So again, alternatives to synthetic pesticides. We spoke about the biological controls already. These are your natural predators and parasites with pheromones and hormones that can kind of control your pest. You have ecological controls using plant diversity to provide habitats for predators of pest species. This is another reason why monoculture is a disaster because you only have one type of plant. You can't put other plants in that you, that the predators of the pest species can live with, right? If you have polyculture, now you have all these different type of plants growing in the same area with different niches, allowing for different organisms to uh, thrive there. And again, some of these organisms could be predators of the pest, of the pest species that you want to control. There's also cultivation controls. You can vary crops and adjust planting times to try to avoid the pests. However, IPM is a component of a more sustainable agriculture. Again, we spoke about this a couple of slides ago. This is your integrated pest management. Basically, you use a little bit of everything, right? So this is a program in which each crop and its pests are evaluated as parts of an ecosystem. The goal is to minimize the use of synthetic pesticides. Again, you're going to use only synthetic pesticides when you have to. The rest of the time in IPM, you're trying to use the natural predators or, again, the natural ecological services that are out there to help reduce the pests on your crop. Obviously, some disadvantages of IPM, you need expert knowledge. So we have to have uh, situations out there where we can educate our farmers. Methods are applied in one area, may not work in another area. See, synthetic pesticides work everywhere, but integrated pest management is going to be a uh, you know, very specific on the environment and the biome that you're in. And the initial costs are going to be higher. So the startup costs, the capital costs are more. But again, down the road, you make up that money by not having to buy synthetic uh, pesticides. All right. So moving on in general, how can we produce food more sustainably? Well, we have to use resources more efficiently. We have to decrease the harmful environmental effects of the industrialized food production, which we've spoke about uh, over the past few slides, and we need to eliminate government subsidies that promote such a harmful impact. So one thing we need to do is conserve topsoil, because what we're finding out is that without the topsoil, again, that's where your humus is, that's where all your nutrients are. If you don't have topsoil, I don't care what you're doing, you're not growing any crops. So soil conservation, we need to do some of these. And we'll talk about these in a little, a little bit more, but there's terracing, there's contour planting, there's strip crop cropping with cover crop, there's alley cropping and agroforestry, windbreaks or shelter beds, and something called conservation tillage farming. We need to identify our erosion hotspots around the world and then put into practice uh, some of these soil conservation techniques. So what are we looking at? Upper right here, this is terracing, okay? This helps alleviate 
soil erosion because instead of having a hill where the soil can just roll down, you have these terraces, uh, which are basically flat areas within the hill that reduces soil erosion. Number uh, B here is called contour planting or strip cropping. Again, your crops are in strips. Okay, and this again helps alleviate erosion because while there's soil here, there's not soil here. So you have a hard time eroding the soil into an area uh, with grasses and things, which again help uh, to stop erosion. C is called intercropping. This is when you actually put different crops, so inter, different types of crops next to one another, which can also uh, decrease your erosion of topsoil. The final one are wind breaks, right? So what happens is the wind blows, all this soil gets move with the wind, but then the wind hits the windbreak and the wind stops. That allows the soil to drop. And so instead of the soil being eroded away, it basically stays uh, right on the farm there. May need to get pushed back across the field, uh, but it basically stays on the farm. So again, these are windbreaks. So understand A, B, C, and D. Again, terracing, contour planting, intercropping, and windbreaks. Understand how they help uh, conserve our soil. We also need to restore soil fertility around the globe. Uh, we can do this using organic fertilizers, animal manure, green manure, and compost. Uh, we also do it with manufactured inorganic fertilizers like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. We can also use something called biochar. We can also use crop rotation, right, where you plant different crops in different fields, uh, allowing a field to maybe not have a crop in it for a year to allow that soil fertility to increase once again. We need to reduce soil salinization and desertification. Again, we spoke about this in uh, part one of this lecture, how this is an issue when you have um, industrialized or mass food production. What, again, soil salinization is when irrigated water, as it continues to dry and you put more irrigated water, leaves the salts around um, in the soil. And there are costly solutions. There's really no good solution once your soil has become uh, salty to get that salt out. Uh, des desertification, a little bit better. We can reduce population growth, overgraving, uh, over grazing, deforestation, and we can reduce the destructive forms of planting, irrigation, and mining. That would help with desertification. And also plant trees that anchor topsoil, right? The trees, roots, anchor topsoil, don't allow it to get eroded away. So if we can plant trees, uh, more trees, that could also alleviate uh, the effects of desertification. So soil salinization, prevention, reduce irrigation, use more efficient irrigation methods and switch to salt tolerant crops, which can grow in a more salty environment. Obviously clean up, not a lot of uh, options here. You can flush the soil. It's expensive though and inefficient. You can stop growing crops for two to five years, but again, you're gonna lose a lot of money if you're a farmer and you could install underground drainage systems to kind of suck that water away, not allow it to just dry out um, on the soil. Um, but again, that costs a lot of money. So not a lot of good uh, solutions for soil salinization and desertification. Obviously, the cheapest way is to don't let it happen in the first place. We need to produce and consume meat and dairy products more sustainably. Shift from less efficient forms of animal protein to more efficient. Pork and poultry are more efficient than beef when it comes to calorie intake and energy. So actually, uh, chicken and pigs are better for us to eat than, than, than red meat. Reduce or eliminate meat intake, obviously. Insects could be another source of protein. There are some people who like to eat grasshoppers around the world. I'm not one of them. Uh, but you actually could eat insects to get your protein, enough protein there. Uh, India's dairy industry uses crop residues, such as rice straw and corn stalks, to actually make some kind of milk. Um, this, save, this actually saves energy and reduces greenhouse gas emissions. So what we're looking at here is the amount of food uh, or amount of feed, excuse me, required to produce 1,000 calories of meat for human consumption. Again, this is feed that we're growing that could be used to feed other people. Look how much, okay, we need uh, the amount of feed. You need 36,000 calories of feed to produce 1,000 calorie of beef for humans. You'll notice pork, poultry, eggs, and dairy, we start to reduce that. So this is why I say pork and poultry is more efficient than beef because it doesn't, we don't need that many calories of feed to produce, again, you're using the same amount of feed, but you're, um, excuse me, you're producing much less feed, right, for the same amount of calories. We're trying to get a thousand calories for human, for human, for human intake. 
Beef, you need 36,000 calories of feed for that 1,000 calories of intake. Pork, you only need 11,000 calories of feed. Poultry, you need 8,000 calories of feed for that 1,000 calorie intake. So again, much more efficient. We also need to practice more sustainable aquaculture. Aquaculture Stewardship Council developed sustainability standards for aquaculture, certified 4.6% of the world's aquaculture operations. That means uh, many, many more percentage there are not certified. Uh, um, open o open ocean aquaculture could be a little better than along the shoreline, but obviously that's harder to get to. Uh, recirculating aquaculture, which is where water is continually recycled. And poly aquaculture, which means not having just the same fish in the fish farm, but having different types of fish there could also help with sustainability. Um, solution for more sustainable aquaculture, again, protect those mangrove forests and estuaries. That's why you can move it more to the open ocean. Improve the management of wastes reduce escape of aquaculture species into the wild, because we don't know exactly uh, what they're going to do in the wild, set up self-sustaining polyaquacultural systems that combine plants, fish, and shellfish all together, which is more like your natural environment uh, than, again, just having salmon, uh, just salmon in, the, in these, uh, in these uh, fish farms. Again, Poly agriculture, similar to poly culture when it comes to uh, when it comes to crops, right? And again, certify sustainable forms of agriculture, aquaculture, so you know what you're buying. All right. Again, we need to shift to more sustainable food production. Components of sustainable agriculture rely on more organic polyculture, right? Less on the conventional monoculture. Grow perennial crops. Rely more on renewable energy. Tailor fertilizers to different soil conditions to minimize runoff. And again, irrigate more efficiency, efficiently. So again, more sustainable food production. Here you go. More or less. More high yield polyculture, more organic fertilizers, more biological pest controls, right? Efficient irrigation, crop rotation, soil conservation. We need less soil erosion, soil salinization, less water pollution, less overgrazing, overfishing, less loss of biodiversity, less fuel use, less greenhouse gas emissions as well. All right. So, what can you do? Eat less meat, no meat, or organ organically certified meat. Choose sustainably produced herbivorous fish. Use organic farming to grow some of your food. Buy certified organic, organic food. Eat locally grown food. Compost your waste and cut food waste as well. So government policies have controlled food prices and provided subsidies. New England and Brazil, excuse me, New Zealand and Brazil have ended farm subsidies successfully. Government and private programs that target poverty can improve food security. Again, low interest loans, uh, immunizations, and vitamins for uh, children. How can we grow and buy food more locally? Community supported agriculture. People buy a share of a local farmer's crops. They receive a box of produce on a regular basis. This supports local economy economies and farm families. Much food waste occurs in restaurants, homes, and supermarkets. We throw out up to 40% of our food each year. Uh, if we can cut that, there'd be a lot more food here on the planet. What are we looking at here? This is one of those community gardens. Again, everyone uh, can enjoy them and everyone can reap the benefits of the harvest. Trade-off, obviously, challenges or growing population, people moving up the food chain, turning food into biofuel. Again, uh, using a lot of uh, a a lot of um, our grains to turn into biofuel, uh, supply side issues, soil erosion, depletion of aquifers, stagnant grain yields, and rising temperatures because of climate change. So what are some solutions? Stabilize your population, eradicate poverty, reduce excessive meat consumption, and eliminate biofuel subsidies conserve soil, use water efficiently, find ways to increase yields, and of course, stabilize your climate. So big ideas, about 795 million people have health problems because they do not get enough food. 2.1 billion face health problems from eating too much food, believe it or not. Uh, modern industrialized agriculture has a greater harmful impact on the environment than any other human activity. Again, we thought we did a great job here uh, to increase food yields. We realize now, decades later, we did not. So we need to find a more sustainable form of food production to greatly reduce the harmful environmental impacts of industrialized food production systems. And that brings us back to the beginning, the growing power, right? That uh, sustainability, that community farm, that guy, Will Allen, right? He relies more on solar energy. 
He conserves topsoil. He re returns crop residues and animal waste to the soil. He relies on a greater variety of crop and animal strains, and he uses polyculture and integrated pest management to control the pests. All right, everyone, that concludes my lecture on part two of chapter 12, food production and the environment. And as always, I thank you for listening.